Welcome to Targeting Putin's Wallets, Exploring the Impact of Sanctions on Russian Oligarchs. My name is Candice Rondeau, and I'm the director of the Future Frontlines program at New America. Future Frontlines, for those of you who don't know, is a program that is trying to level set the conversation about how technology is changing, how we think about power in the global context. A core aim of our program is to tap into the growing movement of journalists, policy analysts, social scientists, computer and information scientists, and human rights defenders who are leveraging publicly available data and information to conduct open source investigations on how power and influence is changing and also to hold power to account. And so in that vein, our conversation today about Russia's oligarchy and the new wave of sanctions triggered by Russia's invasion of Ukraine is extremely apropos. Um, today also marks the launch of our event series, Aftershocks, Russia, Ukraine, and the New World Order, which tracks how the world is responding to Russia's military intervention and the conflict's impacts on Ukraine and the region and the global order writ large. Uh, for the first in event in our series, we are also really proud to be partnering with the Atlantic Council's Geoeconomic Center. The center was founded in 2020 with the purpose of addressing the urgent need to restore confidence in the open rules-based system that the U.S. and its allies have championed over the last 75 years. The Geoeconomic Center bridges the divide between the often siloed sectors of economics, finance, and foreign policy, and serves as a translation hub, helping to shape a better global economic future. So before I introduce our panel, a little bit of housekeeping, I would just want you to engage with us um, as we go forward with this series and also today in our conversation. We're on Twitter uh, by using the hashtag, hashtag oligarchs and following at New America and at ACGOECON, you can be part of the conversation as well. So for the panel, uh, I am pretty psyched about this panel. These are some of my favorite uh, friends and sources when it comes to all things Russia and oligarchy. Uh, first, we have uh, my dear friend, Mike Eckel who is a senior correspondent with the Radio Free Europe Radio Liberty uh, News Service. In addition to being a proud graduate of the Russian Immersion Program at Middlebury College, where I also studied for a little while, Mike has reported extensively on Russia and served for many years as a correspondent for the Associated Press before joining for the RFERL. He's reported on the ground in Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine uh, in many different uh, iterations uh, over time. As the war has gone on, he's reported in Chechnya, he's reported in Georgia, uh, he was there for the 2004 Beslan hostage crisis, and also uh, reported on the, the annexation of Crimea in 2014. There are really few American reporters that I know of who could match his knowledge of Russia and the wider European and Eurasian region. So we're really pleased to welcome Mike to join us today. Uh, we also have with us uh, Luke Harding who is a foreign correspondent with The Guardian and author of Shadow State, Murder, Mayhem, and Russia's Remaking of the West. Luke served as correspondent in Russia for The Guardian from 2007 to 2011, where his sharp and critical reporting on the intersection of Russia's mafia culture and the Russian state and, and the Kremlin power politics earned him the status of persona non grata uh, for a little while. And it also generated a lot of buzz and attention for one of his first books, Mafia State. Luke also brings a lot to the table when it comes to a conversation about the Russia, Russian oligarchy, and we're pleased to have him with us today. And last but not least, uh, my favorite uh, all-time source on all things sanctions, Brian O'Toole, who is a non-resident senior fellow with the Geoeconomic Center at the Atlantic Council, our partners on this series today. And in addition to being uh, a really accomplished expert on sanctions, he also happens to be one of the few people in Washington who can make arcane topics like asset freezes and travel bans sound exciting and fun. So uh, we're really pleased to have him. He served uh, previously before his current position as senior vice president at Truist Financial Corporation. He served with the U.S. Department of Treasury as senior advisor to the director of the Office of Foreign Off Off Assets Control, otherwise known as OFAC here in Washington where he helped manage the implementation of all OFAC administered economic and financial sanctions programs. He also played a very pivotal role in designing the US sanctions regime in response to Russia's aggression in Ukraine and negotiating the multilateral sanctions imposed by the European, European Union and G7 in coordination with the United States. So we're really pleased to have Brian, Luke and Mike with us today. 
let's jump into the conversation. Let me just also remind the audience that we'll get to Q&A about, you know, 40 minutes into the conversation. If you've got questions, please do drop them in that Slido box on the right of the screen, and we will happily take those up. So let me um, just sort of scene set here. We have seen um, unprecedented sanctions uh, lobbied against Russia over the last six weeks. It's been almost kind of a thunderclap for the world economy. And whatever the positioning you know, that the Kremlin may have on it, uh, it is pretty clear that uh, not only Russian institutions and organizations are affected by these changes and, and these sanctions, but individuals, very wealthy, powerful individuals, who many assume have ties to Putin and or the Kremlin and have a pivotal role in shaping not only Russia's economy, but also its, um, its political economy. So the question I think I have, uh, and I think a lot of our audience probably have, is what is new and different about this approach in terms of targeting wealthy Russians, Brian? Yeah, I mean, it's it has been a remarkable six weeks, and you, you make a joke about making sanctions sound interesting. I never thought I'd be hearing, you know, you know, huge media outlets like NPR and, and CBS talking about full blocking sanctions and the distinction between that and, and before. It's just remarkable. Um, you know, I think, look, the, the approach to going after Putin's wallets, the oligarchs, whatever you want to call them, you know, dates back to 2014 and to a certain degree even before, right? There was a, a, a at least a policy acknowledgement that you can't impose pressure on Putin unless you go after the people who are hiding money for him. Um, you know, there's been a, I think one of the challenges that we kind of wrestled with in 2014 and I think is is certainly present today is what's what's the use, right? Are you going to get any effect beyond denying them some assets if you can do that um, for, for money that's frozen in the West? And I think in 2014, there was a strain of thought that went through the, the essential logic of, well, look, you know, these are very rich, powerful people. They hold Putin's wealth. Some of them, others are, you know, magnates in, in Russian business. And, you know, they must have power of their own. And if they, they don't want to lose their money, they might start trying to moderate Putin's, Putin's actions as, as head of state. I, you know, there has not been any real evidence that that is happened. Um, I think maybe if you had done this in 2005, there might have been a little bit more uh, kind of credence to that policy goal. 2014, maybe it was a little muddy as to whether that was viable as a goal or not. I think today it's pretty clear that, um, especially with the increasingly small circle of advisors um, Putin relies on, basically the Soloviki, his, his knuckle draggers in the intelligence services, that, um, you know, that's not really an outcome that anybody can truly hope for doesn't mean they're not legitimate, doesn't mean that um, these sanctions shouldn't happen, right? The, the point of the sanctions right now, as Biden laid out at the outset of this sanctions kind of blitz or thunderclap, as you called it, is to isolate Russia, make it a pariah um, on the global stage. You can't do that and exempt the people who have stolen money left and right, who have made money in, in both legitimate ways and illegitimate ways for, for a lot of these these rich, you know, Russian wallets or oligarchs, um, and you know, it is simply not credible as a sanction strategy to say we're going to isolate Russia's economy, but we're going to let all these guys who are ultra wealthy get off scot free. Um, it just it, it, that logic doesn't hold, and so to me, that's kind of what the policy is now: is it's it's isolation of them from the global economy as much as anything else. So, isn't it also that I'm going to ask Mike this question, but because we've we've debated this for a couple of years now. Um, it's also interesting to kind of reframe the policy objective, you know, move it from influencing Putin to do X, Y, or Z, or, you know, to change his approach to something. But the reality is there, you know, these, many of these oligarchs have been an important pressure release valve for the Kremlin in terms of um, pushing funding into places where it can be hidden away, right, from uh, from much larger kind of corporately oriented sanctions. And we know that Putin's wallets, uh, you know, we, we use that term because this is the strategy has been also to hide his assets and, and the assets of the state uh, in these rather discrete accounts owned by these, by these oligarchs. Mike, you have some thoughts on this, I'm sure. 
Well, that's a good question. Uh, and that the first thought that comes to mind is the, the news that came out this week about the individuals being sanctioned, namely uh, Putin's adult daughters, uh, which uh, was the headline for us and I'm sure for The Guardian and for many other papers around the world. Um, not only did uh, we get uh, sort of formal acknowledgement uh, that these two adult women who have been in and out of the public view for years were his daughters, but uh, it, the, the, the intention is, uh, or the implication is that there's money being hidden, allegedly, uh, from Putin and his inner circle via his, his family members. Uh, and I think that speaks to what you're, what you're talking about, Candice, about you know where where these uh, where these flows these illicit flows are, are going. Are, are the, it's not necessarily the the traditional oligarchs. It's it's, it's non traditional um, uh, avenues, I guess. Uh, remember several years back, uh, I think it was after the uh, was it the Panama Papers when uh, we heard about the world heard about uh, the most famous cellist uh, in the world. Uh, he was a cellist, right, Luke Raul Dugan. You might yeah. be on mute, Luke, and I think Yo-Yo Ma is still the most famous, Mike. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I was just like, uh, Mike, I found him. That's all. I found, uh, Sergei Raldugan, yeah. There we go. So Raldu and that, those revelations, uh, uh, again, they were eye-popping for many reasons, but uh, the revelations talked about how Raldugan allegedly, allegedly was a conduit for some of this money being uh, squirreled away in, in, in weird lo locales in, in, in Europe or otherwise. Um, so, um, you know, the question about whether, uh, you, whether we're, now we're seeing uh, these pressure release valves being cut off for Putin's money is an interesting one. Um, I'll have to think more about that. Um, uh, you know, the, the overall question, the larger question of, of, of whether money is being uh, either cut off from uh, the Kremlin and, and Putin's inner circle, uh, or, or, or whether money is even returning to Russia, being repatriated. That's a, that's, a, that's a separate discussion we could have. It's an interesting one, and I think it's still too early to say. I mean, we're only six weeks into this thunderclap uh, round of, of sanctions, and, and there's a, still a whole lot we don't know economically, fiscally, how this is all going to play out. You know, is the Russian economy going to crater this year because of the sanctions? Quite possibly. Is inflation really going to run at 200%, as I think I heard the White House say the other day? Quite possibly. So uh, I'll turn that over to Luke, I'll pass the baton to Luke to talk about uh, Raul Dugan or others, perhaps. Um, yeah, no, uh, thank, thanks, thanks, uh, th thanks, Mike. I, I mean, I, I just in terms of the, just to be clear, by the way, I'm speaking to you from uh, Lviv in uh, Ukraine, um, where I've been reporting, and in fact, where I met Mike uh, before the invasion, which feels like quite a long time ago. But in terms of Russia, uh, I, I would say there are sort of two big projects going on. One is the kind of noisy, aggressive, revision, revisionist, sort of imperialist project that we're seeing unfolding. We've seen unfolding since February the 24th uh, of, of conquest, of the subjugation of Ukraine, of the annihilation actually of Ukrainians and the destruction of cities from Mariupol uh, to Kharkiv, to Kiev, to Kiev Oblast and region. But the other project that we're talking about today is stealing. And that's been the other driver, the other vector, um, which for, for much of the Putin period, I would say, has been more important than the, than the, the nationalism, has, has just been this sort of business of essentially taking over state assets um uh milking them and hiding this money in a sort of series of offshores and and putin and the people around him they're all billionaires and there's a kind of myth that fairly early on in his his presidency during his first presidential term that he summoned all the oligarchs around the table and basically told them to behave stay out of politics or they'd lose their fortunes that he was some kind of anti-oligarch in fact he's not he's he's an uber oligarch all he did was to redistribute state assets away from some oligarchs towards his friends, most of whom were from the KGB or the FSB, the successor spy agency. And it, it's, 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 it's an oligarchic system. And, and what the key point to understand when, you, when you're trying to conceptualize sanctions is that these oligarchs are not, they're not like kind of brilliant American tycoons or businessmen. They're not Elon Musk's or, or, or Bill Gates. What Some of them are quite you know, talented and cl clever and so on and good at business, but essentially they are informal state functionaries, emissaries, whose fortunes, whose 
whose survival in a very existential way depends on good relations with the Kremlin. And if they fall out, they can run away, bad things can happen. So, so whether sanctions you know, lead to regime change, lead to Putin being deposed, I think it's an unlikely scenario, it, it is, is irrelevant. The, the point is that they're the right thing to do, they're the moral thing to do, and they're, they're the best uh, asymmetric weapon that I think the West, that, that the US can do in this situation as well, obviously, as arming, arming the government of Vladimir Zelensky. So, I, you know, I think they're very effective. I mean, I think that the, the and I'd like, like to throw this back to my sort of co-panelists. I mean, the, the, the question is, why so late? I, I mean, the, the nature of this regime, you know, I wrote a book, Candice was saying, Mafia State, has been obvious to, to a lot of people, to a lot of commentators, you know, myself, but also Gary Kasparov, Anne Applebaum, many, many others. Um, and yet the political leaders have, have largely ignored this pattern of egregious behavior uh, and doubling down by Vladimir Putin over, over a period of years. And it's only now when we have the, the cataclysm of Ukraine that, that you know, the, the world is sort of sanctioning up and, and imposing a, a financial cost on Russia. And, and what the Ukrainians say, you, you talk to people you know, from the Zelensky government, is that we warned you, we warned you, warned you. If you had done this earlier, that might have avoided invasion. Now, I think probably it wouldn't have done, but it's, it's a strong argument. Uh, and I'm just curious. I mean, the US has done sanctions for sure, but nothing on this scale. Why, why was this not done sooner? And that's such a good question. In fact, that goes back to, to Brian's uh, point about so maybe this should have been 2005 or Mike, I think you were also sort of alluding to this idea. <laughs> you should have moved e earlier. I think your take, Luke, if I may, um, you know, take the, the chair's prerogative on the, the role and the function of the oligarchs is, is really right on. I mean, they are not Elon Musk. They are not Bill Gates, uh, you know, and uh, they are kind of like, the plenipotentiaries of the Ministry of Funny, Funny Russian Walks. You know, if Monty Python were going to do like, you know, a follow-up series on this particular period, um, that's what they would be called. And you know, one of our favorites, of course, is Yevgeny Prigozhin, or at least one of my favorites. Everybody knows that <laughs> he's one of my favorites. Um, but he's a very good example. I think there are others, Victor Vexelberg. Uh, you know, uh, maybe some of these other new ones, and uh, Konstantin Malafeev now just being indicted. Be very interested to see the discovery on that, um, even though that it's stemming from old charges. I imagine that there's some innovation, uh, some you know legal juris jurisdiction questions there, but also some innovation on the part of uh, the Department of Justice. So that that does raise this question. One, Brian, let me turn to you on that. Uh, why did it take so long? And now that it's happened, what can we expect, kind of near term and then long term, in terms of the impact on the oligarchy itself? Yeah, you know, I, it's a fascinating question. I'm not. I'm not sure there's any like great answers. Um, you know, I think I think Luke is spot on in talking about the role. I, I've, I'm fond of saying, you know, we used to talk a lot about you know Russian organized crime in the '90s and how some of these guys used to be part of those circles, but now now the state crowded out organized crime. From you know, if you take like the economic term, they crowded out organized crime, and so you know, they're still like drug runners and stuff, but they're not. Not controlling strategic industries the way they did in 1996, um, or shooting each other in the street for that matter. Um, you know, but in terms of like why not until now, I mean, honestly, I think it's there was a, a serious hangover in the West, long term one, that wanted to integrate Russia into the global economy and this thought. You know, it goes back to the idea that, you know, nations with McDonald's don't go to war with each other, you know, all these kind of theories about how trade, trade normalizes relations and drives, um, drives these, these processes forward. And I think we were just fundamentally as the West slow on the uptake to understand this is not what Putin's goal is. And we were slow to realize what his goals were. Um, you know, there were successive administrations that tried resets. President Bush looked deep into Putin's eyes and saw his soul, right? Like those are, those are people who want to integrate Russia because they, they believe that the Russian people are going to be better off with Western trade and values and all those things. But, um, you know, fundamentally, I think our, our, you know, kind of the first warning should have been Grozny, honestly, in 1999. But after that, it should have been the invasion of Georgia, which took place you know, just at, at 
in some ways at the wrong time. It was a turnover of administrations and everybody lost focus. Um, you know, governments have attention spans. They do. It's the way it works. And so I think, I think honestly, that's what it was. People were slow to, to really grasp what Putin's goals were. Um, you know, and there were too many, too many excuses made along the way with good intentions, right? Intentions of helping the Russian people, the Russian economy and, and integrating Russia. Um, but, but too many excuses made along the way for Putin's behavior. And the near-term effect, would you, any, any ideas about that? Any thoughts about sort of what we might see maybe six months from now or toward the end of this, this calendar year? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think honestly, the hope needs to be against a, a reversion to that, right? I, I think, you know, 2014 started down this path, but, you know, and, and we should have understood this in Syria earlier than that too, but, you know, I think, I think the thing that the West needs to guard against is a reversion to, oh, well, we should just reintegrate Russia um, because it's better for the global economy, it's better for Russia and Russians, um, and understand that, you know, the Kremlin and its functionaries, um, which extend to a huge portion of the economy, this is not acceptable behavior. They have pillaged Russia, they have abused the West, they are Putin's fundamental goal is to undermine Western democratic norms and institutions and Western democracy as a, as a governing kind of principle, while at the same time he's getting rich off of it, right? Those, those are things that don't square and they're not changing regardless of whether troops get pulled back or they only go for the Donbass. I think, I think that's the, the lens everybody has to bear in mind here and be careful against people aren't being killed all the time so we can have some sort of reversion to norms. I think that's 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 going to be a tendency in some places and we've got to, that's where everybody needs to be careful so the magic elixir of neoliberal liberal economics didn't work i mean i think we can i think one of the implications of you know these aftershocks is this real paradigm shift in our understanding of whether or not uh the medicine a of shock therapy right and then b of kind of you know Let's let's embrace and let's integrate these state capitalist autocracies like Russia, like China. Um, let's see if we can digest that giant elephant. Uh, and it turns out we can't. <laughs> so, Mike, what do you think is going to happen near term? Boy, shock therapy. Well, you're going way back with that with that comment. <laughs> Always about the old school. Always about yeah. The old school. Boy, we we give people have right dissertations and have endless discussions about what what. What went wrong? Did in the '90s and uh, did the West screw up with, with uh, with shock therapy and the Yeltsin years? That's not the uh, goal of this webinar. Uh, I mean, in the near future, we're we're already seeing trend lines. We're seeing this, um, you know, in terms of uh, like public. Uh, well, so one thing, and this is because I was writing about this issue today. Uh, I was writing about public sentiment, public polling in Russia. And what Russian society is is feeling, how they're viewing uh, Putin and and the war in Ukraine, a uh, special military operation in Ukraine, excuse me. Um, and and we we are seeing a bit of a rally around the flag uh, phenomenon going on in 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 Russia, uh, and that's playing out in in some of the polling. Um, it's unclear whether that's sustainable, and in particular it, whether it's un it's unclear whether that's sustainable as the economic uh, after uh, shocks or ripples uh, of the sanctions really sort of take hold and and uh, take hold over the over the over the next the coming quarters. Um, I think by this fall it'll be really interesting. By the fall it'll be very interesting to see what happens in terms of. Um, uh, will there be shortages of, of food stuffs, um, medicines? Uh, will inflation indeed be rampant by that time, as the White House is is predicting? Um, will we see uh, you know mass layoffs? Uh, we're already seeing that at some industrial giants, uh, automobile manufacturers, Optimus, uh, I believe, is uh, one great example. Um, so we'll have to see how that ripples through the economy, uh, and I think by the fall. Um, assuming everything stays in place and assuming, you know, the war is still continuing, um, these are big ifs, but um, I think the fall will be a critical moment to see how these economic measures play out. Um, and in terms of uh, the oligarchs, um, 
uh, I think we're already, uh, Brian, I think alluded to this, we're, we're, we're seeing this, this closing of the, of, of, the, of the circle of the counselors that are actually able to have Putin's ear and give him guidance on the conduct of the war in relations with the West. And, and um, there's ample uh, reporting, uh, intelligence and speculation that um, he's been getting bad counsel from his closest advisors who are not the oligarchs per se in the traditional sense of the word. They're the Siloviki, they're the Bortnikov, Patrushev, Shoigu, Defense Minister, FSB Chief, uh, Security Council. They are not Anatoly Chubayas, one of the original oligarchs who as many people on this call know, uh, apparently fled Russia last week or the week before and was seen withdrawing cash from an ATM in Istanbul. Um, uh, Chubais does not have Putin's ear and, and has not had his ear for a while. Um, and that's, I think, a danger because, you know, if conventional wisdom is to be believed, Chubais was, you know, conceivably a moderating in influence, a uh, moderating source of counsel for, for Putin. Um, and, you know, the lack of those moderating voices, I think, bodes poorly bo for the conduct of the war, but also for you know, this reversion to a, a potential or Soviet police state that, uh, that we're seeing. So there's also that interfactionalism, I think we're also starting to see come to the fore, as you're just alluding to in a way. Um, you know, Chubais leaves the, the stage that means that Medvedev, for whatever he's worth, uh, you know, is a little bit more isolated in some ways. There are others who are, you know, going to lose their political anchors as the oligarchs start to um, be unable to be to grease the wheels, I think. What do you think about that, Luke? Well, I, it's it's funny you mentioned Medvedev. I, I was um uh, I was just raising a, a, a wry smile. I was in um, Moscow as Guardian Bureau Chief when Medvedev was um was president of Russia and Putin was prime minister. Uh, uh, and the, the joke going around, going around um, Moscow in those days was that there was a distinct Medvedev camp in the Kremlin. Uh, which was supposedly more liberal, but it wasn't clear whether Medvedev was in the Medvedev camp. So, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, he he's turned into this kind of, uh, you know, uh, ridiculous sort of kind of hardliner um, who's trying to out Putin Putin with his statements about the Ukrainians being vassals and there's no point in talking to them. We only have to talk to the suzerain, which is you guys, it's it's the Americans. Um, but I, what, what I wanted to say was, I just wanted to say something about the way that you, you talk of economic progress and, and how that's all been undone, unraveled. 25 years of integration with the West has, has gone with this thunderclap. And uh, I, th I, I do think there's there's been another sort of problem in in sort of Western analysis of, of, of Putin's mental universe. And it's a very strange place. And, and you know, M Mike's written pieces about criminology before and so have I. And in a way, you don't want to kind of peer too deeply. But what, what, what's clear is that, you know, the Russians in general, by which I mean the elite, and Putin in particular, do not think, uh, as one British civil servant told me, the way we think they should think. They, they think completely differently. And, and uh, you know, I was sitting in Kiev ahead of the invasion, really convinced that, that Putin was going to do it. And a lot of people were saying, no, he can't, it's irrational, you know, think of the sanctions and the consequences, they would be terrible, the economy would suffer, people would suffer. And actually, it, it turns out that, that Putin has been sitting on his own in his bunker uh, for, for two years, seeing almost no one brooding about, um, you know, Russia's imperial destiny and his, his great Nietzschean role in it. And he's been reading history. He's been reading Alexander Solzhenitsyn, He's been reading uh, the chronicles of a bygone age about medieval Kiev and Rus. He's been thinking about St. Vladimir who founded Kiev back in the 10th century and that maybe he can be a new St. Vladimir reclaiming and reuniting historical lands. And he's not thinking about neoliberalism. He's not thinking about, oh gosh, we might lose McDonald's or, or um, American sanctions. He, he's in this kind of misty, romantic, grand historical fantasy where basically he's Prince Vladimir or Nicholas I with a bit of Solzhenitsyn thrown in. Um, and because he's in this strange space, this strange unreachable space, it means that any kind of rational economic consideration goes out the window. And just one final point, which is that he has a kind of great narrative, a counter narrative for all this, which is to say, I always told you the West was out to get us. We were surrounded by hostile enemies led by the Glavny Protivnik, the main enemy, America, 
as in KGB times. And look, I've been proved right. They've done all these beastly, nasty, terrible things to us because they hate us and they want to sort of stop us from being great again. Therefore, we have to defend ourselves from this hegemonistic attack by the US and its satellites, which, by the way, includes my country, Great Britain, uh, or not so Great Britain, as I now regard it. Um, uh, and, and so, you know, so basically we should do these things, but the, I don't think they will, they will change Putin's behavior. They won't change the way he thinks about the world, which is extremely strange. And, and you know, just very last point, you know, when, when I go out and get coffee and talk to Ukrainian refugees in Lviv, I say, look, how can this thing end? And they all say, they all say one thing, it's just, and it's very simple. They just say, we need to kill Putin. And I think... You know, when Putin is dead, this war will stop and probably these sanctions will begin to ease. I shouldn't laugh. I mean, I don't mean to be flippant, uh, but I hear that a lot, too. I mean, I hear that, you know, at the kitchen table, you know, when I go home to see family. I, you know, I think this is the conversation people are kind of starting to recognize that he is an obstacle. But I want to also comment on your point. Your, your description of Putin um, reminds me a little bit of a show, a movie, a very old movie. I'm dating myself a little bit. Flash Gordon and like how Ming... It was like this evil, <laughs> it was like the evil villain who just really thought he was like the czar of space, you know, like really, this is totally true. You're also reminding me um, about this, uh, this long running kind of historical um, framing of Russian leadership generally amongst political elites. Uh, and also the idea of what is morally right and what is ethically right being so diametrically opposed to how uh, so many in the U.S. and Europe and the U.K. kind of frame what is morally right and what is ethical. And it, it reminds me of uh, a, a guy named Vladimir Lefebvre, who wrote very famously uh, a theoretical sort of proposition looking at the long-running rivalry between Russia uh, and the United States and, and the different algebra of conscience, was the name of the book, um, that we each apply when we're kind of looking at what is wrong, what is right, what is just leadership? What is you know moral uh, leadership? And I think it's totally right that Putin operates in a world and in a tradition that is quite diametrically opposed uh, to that of the United States, certainly, and that of uh, Europe and and the UK. And so to expect him then to respond to things that we think are morally right um, is probably a little bit unrealistic. But Brian, let me turn to you on this question of. Uh, now kind of the reaction that we're seeing from some of these oligarchs, because we've, we've seen different folks being asked, well, aren't you sorry <laughs> you know, that you've been in league with Putin for so long and now that you're being punished and your yacht's being taken away, what do you think, Mr. Mikhail Friedman? What do you, what do you think you should be doing? <laughs> what do you think about that, Brian? Yeah, I mean, you know, that they run into the same problem that pollsters do, right, where it's, <clears throat> you know, they're not going to give a truthful public answer about any of that. I'm sure a lot of them are furious privately. Y you know, the this whole conversation about, like, morality and, and where Putin is thinking diametrically opposed to, to the West is all very relevant, I think, for how people need to, to conceive of this. The, the points if I'm being frank, that, that I tried to get across to, to Russians and others who were, were talking about these things ahead of the invasion, you know, and saying, look, it, all these guys around Putin, they don't care. They just want to go back to the USSR. They think they can export wheat and, and energy and they're going to be fine. Um, and I kept telling them that's crazy because you don't understand the way that the, the economy works globally now. Nobody's flying planes of cash around to settle up transactions or anything like that anymore now. All of it comes through New York. And so fundamentally, you are going to turn Russia into an autarky if, if they go down this path. And I think, you know, setting aside whether Putin cares about economics or not and, and economic growth, I think the fundamental question in my mind about all of this, and this is a roundabout way of getting to your question on the oligarchs, is, you know, there are substitution effects that have to take place right now, right? They are taking all of their FX earnings from energy sales plugging it into the market to prop up the, the value of the ruble. The ruble spread overseas is, you know, is dramatic compared to what it is at home. I mean, it's just like almost inconceivable spreads for buy-sell. And what that means, though, is they're not spending that money on what they want to spend it on, right? Presumably, some of the, the graft that would be happening is not able to happen because Putin needs that money to either fuel a war effort, to prop up the economy so there's not this complete and utter collapse. Um, and they're certainly 
you know, almost certainly not reinvesting in their energy infrastructure, which is Venezuela, you know, historically can tell everybody is a really terrible idea. So, you know, these things are eroding over time. And I think that's, that's where this is going to get interesting is, you know, whether or not somebody assassinates Putin, right? He's not a young guy and setting aside the fact that these dictators like Mugabe tend to live until they're, you know, a million years old. You know he's going to be out of power at some point, and I, I do think that the the cracking of that base of of the kleptocratic system, which I think is happening, is going to have a huge impact. Whether they'll whether the oligarchs will say it publicly or not, right? If they can't generate the same amount of wealth as you talked about, they're not going to be greasing the skids. Um, and I think you know they're not going to publicly break with Putin because then they're going to turn into Hodorkovsky. You know we saw. Um, What's his name? The the net the guy who owned the Nets for a couple of years, the the basketball team in New York. Yeah, Prokhorov. Made, yeah, Prokhorov. He he made he made some noises about politics and then quickly backed down after Putin freaked out. Right, like they're not going to go down that route. But there's there's going to be some stuff that starts to happen. I suspect behind closed doors, um, and that's all going to be very interesting because at some point Putin's not going to be in power, and whoever the heck takes that takes that place atop the throne is going to have a heck of a job consolidating power inside of Russia, let alone trying to manage all these external misadventures that Putin's gotten into. And at that point, I think is when the sanctions become very useful because trading sanctions relief for getting the heck out of Syria, Ukraine, you know, Belarus and Moldova, um, you know, that, that may be very attractive to whomever that person is. So that, I mean, are we going to go, it sounds to me like we might be headed back for like another uh, Banditsky uh, Peter, you know, like the, back to the old, let's uh, see who rise to the top of the mafia heat. What do you think, Mike? Mm. Boy, that's an interesting question. You know, back in a calmer, quainter time, um, us Russian reporters were writing about the Duma election and about the presidential election and the constitutional amendments. Remember, there was all this discussion about whether Putin would stay in power uh, how you do it. And, um, you know, that's still a relevant conversation, though clearly that's dropped down the order of priorities these days. But um, <clears throat> at the time that we were writing about this issue, there is, you know, the whole discussion about, uh, you know, is there a succession plan? Is there a, is there, is, is there a lame, is it Putin is a lame duck? Is there a rival waiting in the wings? Is there another Medvedev type of uh, anointed successor who's going to pop onto the scene. Um, we didn't see any of that. Um, we saw, of course, you know, the stage managed choreographed uh, referendum for the constitutional amendments. Then we had the Duma election. Um, and so, um, but the, the thinking at the time was, um, you know, the minute that Putin says, you know, shows any sort of inkling that he's on his way out the door, that there's going to be all of a sudden this mad scramble among the rival uh, clans and power bases within the, the Kremlin and, and within the wider, you know, secondary, third, tertiary circles around him. Um, and you know, the thinking was that that's why we didn't see any of that, um, and that the Kremlin was keeping the cards very close to its chest in terms of Putin's plans for the coming presidential election. Now we have a war on our hands and everything is scrambled. The oligarchs are returning home to roost. Putin's ear is taken up by the, the Siloviki. And, um, you know, the, it's even, and we, he's supposed to be up for election. His term is supposed to come due in two years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, you know, the whole deck has been shuffled and it's, it's a really interesting period of time notwithstanding the fact that the economy is about to collapse and Russians are going to start hearing more about body bags and soldiers coming home, paratroopers being buried in school for Krasnodar. Uh, and that's going to have a long-term knock-on effect, I think, on um, you know, these discussions at, in, in Moscow. Um, I wanted to say something else about, you were talking about the, 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 the difference between Putin and how, and how he's different than, than the West. And I think it comes down to how the Kremlin has historically seen the state, the role of the Russian state. It's a very different relationship than the state that you and I, uh, Candace, have with our government or, or in the UK for that matter, you know, in, in a democratic system. 
you know, in Russia, it's the state is the paramount, you know, cre uh, creation and Putin exists as the state. He is the state. It's almost like a Letat-Semois kind of situation. And everything he does is for the greater good of the state and the Russian people serve the state. And that's the relationship there. And the oligarchs are in that same position, at least historically. And we've heard that from uh, many oligarchs talking about how they're allowed to make money as long as they don't meddle in politics, a la Khodorkovsky. Uh, and a lot of uh, the participants in the chat today will recall uh, the words that Pyotr Avin uh, said back when he was speaking to Robert Mueller, the special counsel, back in the fallout from the 2016 presidential election. And uh, Avin was asked specifically about Mueller, uh, excuse me, Avin was asked by Mueller about this relationship between oligarchs and Putin. And he said, um, you know, that the, the, the oligarchs took these meetings very seriously and they understood that any suggestions or critiques that Putin made during these meetings were implicit directives. And that's the takeaway from that report and that something that everyone should take away from any discussion about oligarchs today is implicit directives, because that's the relationship that defines the relationship between the oligarch and the Kremlin and Putin. And uh, you know we're seeing that 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 implicit directive uh, guidance shaken now because of the war and now because of the thunderclap of sanctions. Um, but uh, you know the fact remains that um, you know the, the the people who used to be able to guide Putin and offer counter uh, counsel like the Chubayases, like the Avin, like the Friedmans are are no longer able to get in there in the same way that they were. And, and so, I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty in that, in that regard. So I know, uh, well, they, go ahead. Luke, yeah, I was gonna jump, jump soon. Yeah. yeah, I was just gonna jump. Uh, no, I was just gonna say one last thing, which is that, that I, 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 do, I do think the subject of, of private Russian elite conversations is endlessly fascinating. I mean, we, 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 you know, you read the New York Times, Washington Post, you get these sort of great graphic, well-reported stories about what's happening on Ukraine and the ground and so on. But what we're missing is what are people saying to each other in Moscow? And the problem is that you can't really do that journalistically. I mean, maybe if there's some super spy in the Kremlin, we'll find out in 20 years time, or maybe the CIA, no, I suspect they, they don't. I mean, the only way to do it is, is almost novelistically. I mean, you can imagine it. You can imagine these conversations. And what we do know from some leaks is that there is enormous sort of cadre turmoil that Putin has placed, for example, the head of the fifth service of the FSB, which is responsible for foreign intelligence, and told him that Ukrainians were going to rise up and, and greet their Russian liberators with flowers and kisses. And it turns out they greeted them with, with uh, anti-tank missiles and, and javelins in, instead. Um, so they're under house arrest. There are rumors that he's dissatisfied with the head of the SVR, foreign intelligence, with Sergei Nerishkin, whom he bawled out at the sec famous Security Council meeting three days before the invasion. Uh, and you can imagine these oligarchs whose, whose yachts, villas have been impounded, whose fortunes have evaporated, whose bank cards don't work anymore, are pretty annoyed by this. Um, you know, whether this blows back into some kind of political change, I don't know, certainly not immediately, but, but that I think there's the biggest turmoil going on in Russia since since its independence from the, the, the you know, since, since the breakup of the Soviet Union 30 years ago. And just one final slightly gloomy idea, I was talking to a, a sort of very senior Ukrainian government official today who was saying, you know, the Russians feel they have to win this. If they do not prevail in Ukraine, the Russian state falls. So if it's going bad on the battlefield, expect them to do anything to win this war. Existential. Totally essential. Luke, thank you for joining us from the field. We'll see you again. Don't leave folks, we're still talking. Um, actually, let me, uh, since now we've got about ooh, about 15 minutes here and I know I see a ton of questions in our queue. Uh, so let me turn to some of those. Yeah, and I think this one, this very first one is actually a very good one. It kind of dovetails with something I wanted to ask you. You know, we have now these uh, kleptocracy task forces. One stood up here uh, domestically that has joint jurisdictions and agencies all working together. And then this multilateral task force where there's gonna be a lot of intelligence sharing and information sharing and hopefully cooperation. Um, so are there any remaining sanctions on the table at this point that uh, you know, the US or others in the coalition need to be thinking about trying out? And I will just add to that, 
you know, given what we know about, you know, hashtag Yacht Watch, which has been fascinating, you know, all the different lovely, beautiful boats that have been seized or, or at least uh, stopped in, in various ports. Uh, and then the other day, I think uh, there's some art coming from Finland that has been held uh, that was due into St. Petersburg. So, I mean, there's been a lot of very creative thinking, but is there more creative thinking on sanctions against oligarchs or other sections of the Russian economy, Brian, that we should be thinking about? Yeah, I mean, look, I think the yachts are kind of tacky myself, but, um, you know, my, my take on this is, is maybe a little bit different than, than some others have. I fundamentally don't think that, at least in the short term, that oligarch sanctions matter. Um, you know, at, at least from like an economic perspective and what they're doing, right? The, what they did to the central bank, the, the G7, um, is just so dramatically different and much and, you know, su substantially more impactful than even seizing a $600 million yacht, right? That's flashy. It, it helps for public messaging and things like that. So it's not entirely useless. But, you know, for people who are getting bent out of shape about whether the U.S. has done oligarch X, you know, Friedman or, or you know, Avin and the EU has, you know, the U.S. hasn't done them, the EU has, or the U.K. has, I think that's a longer term problem to manage. I, I would expect that, that could, there is some stabilization and normalization across that, right, um, over time. And I, I do think that it's important to get those things kind of equal, on equal footing between the US, UK, and European Union. Um, but I think fundamentally, the, the sanctions that are out there that remain that are impactful are energy sanctions. Um, they're going after the Russian capital markets themselves. They're going after kind of squaring off the rest of the Russian banking sector, right? Gazprom Bank is sanctioned in the UK. That's probably the last really big ticket item remaining in the, the banking world until maybe the US and Europe decide to pull their, their Western banks out, um, you know, because that those are also pretty big in, in Moscow. Um, you know, there's things like the new investment ban the US just put out um, yesterday. That's a big, a big deal. But an even bigger deal is a full financial embargo. Like that's where you start getting the kind of big impacts that, that get you towards where Russia is, Iran, or North Korea. Um, and oligarch sanctions are important, but they don't get you there. Um, and so I do think you'll see oligarchs rolled out alongside other sanctions packages, um, because there's a clear preference for a drumbeat of sanctions from the West. It's going to happen every week. It's going to happen sometimes twice or three times a week. Um, but realistically, right, like, Seizing a yacht makes a pretty picture, but it doesn't really do much for for bailing out Russian banks or you know going after going after Alpha Bank, which the U.S. did yesterday. Right? Those are just very very different things. The yacht doesn't have a reverberation across the Russian economy. Blocking Alpha Bank takes out everybody who uses Alpha Bank in the country from the ability to, to conduct essentially all cross border transactions or most of them. But there are I'll some. Jump in. Go ahead. I was going to say to you, actually, Mike. There are some counterintuitive asset classes I think we've encountered that people might not be thinking about, but go ahead, jump in. Well, I was going to say uh, a, a counterintuitive thought that, you know, the yachts, yeah, they might be flashy and they might not have the same sort of substance um, as like this going after Sparta Bank or Alpha Bank, but there is a, uh, an, uh, naming and shaming is an important tool in this as well. And as a, you know, as a, as a person, as a journalist, an investigator who researches, you know, corporate databases and, and court records and, and, and tries to trace all this stuff and, and beneficial ownership, you know, ha that, having that information out there so that people like my organization or the Bellingcats or the other re can, can follow the money trail and, and, and publish, expose, reveal where this money is, I think that's a very important thing. Again, it may not have the same sort of oomph that, uh, that, that sanctioning Sparta Bank or, or freezing Friedman's asset, assets might have, but I think it's an important tool in, in, in this discussion. Um, I, think, I think that's exactly right. You know, I think, you know, because when we talked about this a little bit before we got on the phone or on the call itself, right, sometimes symbols matter, right? And, and it's a hell of a lot easier to explain a yacht, this big $600 million yacht being seized, you know, whatever Vexelberg's was or, you know, whomever it you know, those things are easy and, and clear explanations of what the sanctions impact is. 
Whereas I referenced the ruble spread earlier on this uh, in this discussion, and you know, there's just not that many people around the world who who a care about that or kind of fundamentally understand why it makes a difference. And it's really hard to explain that to people. So, you know, it it does matter to have those yacht seas too because it it provides some of that comfort that the U, that the West is taking action. Right, we're not just watching Russia kill Ukrainians indiscriminately. Yeah. So. <laughs> I mean, this, it, it's interesting to think about like sort of um, the visual impact of these, of, of these yachts, of course, being seized. Um, I do think that there's some other interesting questions here that are kind of related to this. And you, and you just alluded to that, uh, Mike, uh, you know, kind of the need to provide transparency on, on ownership. And, you know, so now, you know, with these kleptocracy task forces, it will be very interesting to see, you know, can they get beyond these splashy announcements and, you know, what kind of information, when you imagine the information you don't have right now, um, that would create more transparency and more naming and shaming being much more effective, what do you, what do you have in mind? Boy, you know, beneficial ownership. I mean, I mean, where is the, where is the company, the owner of the company that owns a company that owns a company that owns a company? I mean, it takes so much time to, to dig through this stuff and, and people like yourself and Brian, uh, I mean, they understand how much effort this takes, but I mean, you really spend your days going down these rabbit holes to find out where these companies are and where the jurisdictions are. And, and uh, um, you know, I know that there are discussions about improving beneficial, beneficiary ownership, uh, you know, transparency um, in, 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 in Europe and in the U.S. to some degree. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a powerful tool. Uh, when you're talking about um, trying to pressure, uh, to, to hit a pressure point um, to affect change uh, for oligarchs who may then be able to translate that change back in, 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 in Moscow. Candice, you asked about other asset classes uh, that people should be looking at. Um, there was discussion, I think, briefly from Brian about art, uh, artwork being uh, a problematic uh, industry for many, many years used to, uh, to, to either launder funds or to hide away funds in offshore locations. Um, cryptocurrencies, I think, are uh, already a huge uh, problem or issue. And, and I'm, 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 I'm aware that, that I think the Biden administration has already signaled that that's going to be a priority. Um, and I think if I had to guess, I'd say they're probably behind the behind the ball in this regard. The Russians have been have embraced cryptocurrency both officially and unofficially for many years, um, and um, I mean, the best example of that is is the fact that in one of the Mueller indictments of the GRU agents charged with uh, in interfering in the in the presidential election, there were Bitcoin addresses that were uh, included in the indictment uh, that showed how. Uh, the GRU was using money to using uh, cryptocurrency wallets to transfer money to to perform these meddling actions. So uh, the point being is, I think cryptocurrency is is an asset class that needs to be looked at hard and aggressively and more aggressively than than I think has been done certainly in Washington. Yeah, I mean, I, I know that um, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren has been talking about this in Congress, along with a couple of other um, Congress folks, in terms of cutting off that cryptocurrency avenue, uh, finding ways to make it a much more transparent industry uh, generally and getting fidelity and due diligence on, you know, know, know your clients, right? Know your patron, know, know who it is you're dealing with. I think that's gonna be really, really important. Um, there's another question here from, I think our colleague Celia. Um, and I, I think this is a good one. I'll just put a little bit of a spin on it. She asked, what is, a role, what is the role of the Russian Orthodox Church in influencing Putin? And here I would just add, just because we know about uh, certain characters, certain oligarchs like Konstantin Malofeyev, uh, who has used his relationship with the Russian Orthodox Church uh, prelates and, and power brokers to um, kind of zhuzh up his profile. But also, I suspect uh, that's been a very interesting avenue for laundering both reputation and money. Mike, do you want to speak to that first and then I'll get to Brian? It's a good question. And, and I think much more investigation needs to be done in this in this regard. In terms of reputation, I'm without question. I mean, the Kremlin 
I, I, and of course, I mean, this is a historical fact, the relationship between the Russian church and, and, and the Kremlin going back hundreds of years. Um, uh, but more recently, uh, you know, Putin has made it very, has, has, has made his embrace of, of uh, the, the church uh, a central part of his, his political persona. Uh, and, and the church has been happy to, to return the favor in terms of uh, whatever blessing projects, you know, pr promulgating various sorts of philosophical notions that 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 um, feed into uh, Putin's ideas about, you know, Novorossiya and Russian greatness and the spiritual foundations of, of the Russian people. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not telling anyone here that anything they don't already know that the, the, the Kremlin and the Russian church are very much intertwined. And in terms of the finances of the church, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a hugely wealthy church and there are assets, uh, I'm sure, squirreled away in places around the world. It's definitely an area uh, that, that needs to be investigated more. A huge black box. What do you think, Brian? Yeah, I mean... You know, look, you guys know much more about the, the Russian Orthodox Church than I do. I mean, I think, the, I, but I would I would echo the point that the investigation needs to happen, right? I mean, there's there was the famous incident with Patriarch Kirill a number of years ago wearing a, an 80000 or $100,000 watch, right? That was pretty obvious. And, you know, if we look at our own kind of Western religious orthodoxy, the IOW, the Institute for Religious Works, the Vatican Bank was brought up on money laundering charges, right? So... You know, it's it's not that it's not as if that stuff is is completely foreign in, in this world. So it's um, it probably wouldn't be inappropriate to think of that as another kind of oligarchish power center in some respects. I mean, not not to kind of offend religious sensibilities or anything like that, but you know, it's when you start to to peel away from religion and into money laundering and, and other enabling of corruption, it becomes a very different story. So, I mean, you're now you're kind of broaching just this last question. We have just a few more minutes. Um, so I'll come to you quickly and just say um, the, the ripple effects on other oligarchies. This is the thing that for me, I'm really curious to see. Example, uh, we know that there are lots of folks in some of the Gulf, Gulf states, mm -hmm. Qatar, uh, UAE, who have been dealing very closely and have partnerships, very engaged, active partnerships with a lot of these Russian oligarchs, you know, Igor Sechin, uh, I mean, the heads of these large energy companies and large military um, industrial complex companies have been very deeply entrenched in um, building their own bridges with other oligarchies in other countries. And I just wonder if you have any thoughts about, you know, where we should expect to see those ripple effects, what that might mean for some other kind of near autocracies that the United States has often called friends and partners. I, I would say, uh, Brian probably has a lot to say about this, but I would say without question, we're already seeing how um, uh, oligarch assets are being uh, shifted to less transparent jurisdictions um, out, of, uh, out of Europe uh, and, and, you know, and to places like you know, the Gulf region. Uh, that's, I think, gonna only increase uh, many times over in, in the coming months and years. Um, you know, I mean, the other thought you're talking about oligarchy more general is just, I mean, the larger problem of, of, of oligarchs and their relationship to, to states, um, not only the Gulf. I mean, Ukraine has a problem with oligarchs. Let's not forget the country has been uh, hampered by uh, its oligarchs, maybe even much, to a much greater extent than in Russia for, for many, many years. Um, it's one of the reasons that the 2014 Maidan revolution happened is in part because of the corruption that was allowed to flourish under the Ukrainian oligarchs. Um, and so I, I just want to throw that out there that, you know, the, the problem of, of oligarchs, uh, powerful politically collected businessmen, they're almost all men, uh, and their outsized roles in, uh, you know, perverting uh, the governance of a, of, a, of a country like Russia or, or, or Ukraine is, I, I think, is a, is a longer term problem that uh, that that needs to be looked at. Yeah, Brian, and, got, and just to, kind of, yeah, just to kind of close, and there are kind of two thoughts that come to mind. I mean, one, and this peels back on on some of the conversation earlier about Putin that I just can't get Gaddafi out of my head, right? Um, you know, isolated, dictating everybody. There's no clear successor. Um, even with Gaddafi, he kind of had one, but not really. But either way, the, the point is, 
when you have these kleptocratic oligarchic structures in, in states that we deal with or um, you know friends with, there was a sense in 2011 from the Qaddafi camp of, of betrayal that the US was suddenly imposing and leading the push to impose sanctions on him because he thought he was back in the international community after sanctions were lifted when he gave up his nuclear program. And so I think there's always gonna be that battle of you know how are you conveying Western values and you know, that, that's a particular issue with Saudi Arabia and some of the other kind of Gulf states as well. Um, that I'm not sure we're ever going to really solve fundamentally because politics are politics. The solution to all of this, and this is kind of the second thought, is this is why financial transparency matters. Um, because if you can push the transparency, you can at least set people on something of a level playing ground. Nobody actually knows how rich the Saudis are, um, the same way that nobody knows how rich Putin is. Um, you know, there aren't that many Saudis who appear on Forbes billionaires list, and that, that's a bizarre kind of exclusion. Um, but the financial transparency is key. And I've, I've I, you know, I think it's, it's fantastic that Secretary Yellen got a global agreement on the minimum tax rate. That's really important. The global transparency piece, you know, financial transparency should be kind of a similar level of effort um, for a treasury secretary, whether that's Yellen or, or somebody else in the future. And I think that's kind of how you start to chip away at, at some of the, ex at least the exorbitant privilege that these folks have and, and abuse too often. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Well, listen, we've come to time here. I want to thank you guys for an excellent conversation. Um, as always, you, you guys are just my favorites when it comes to these geeky things like sanctions and, and oligarchs. Uh, so we hope to have you again. Uh, for our, those in our audience, just to remind you that this is the start of a long conversation, we hope, over the next few weeks uh, in the installment of Aftershocks, our series next week. Uh, sorry, on Thursday, April 21st, we're going to... Um, discuss housing, land, and property rights in war-torn Ukraine, and how refugees can reclaim what they've left behind. There's a lot of losses there. You can find out more about the event by clicking on the button below uh, and also following us at New America and at New Frontlines. Uh, we'll be announcing more about our program in the future. Thanks for joining.